closed captioning for the professors is provided in part by the Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury and wrongful death law firm in Chicago. Chicago public school officials have outlined a five-year education plan to repair problems in the massive school system. We'll take a closer look at the plan and whether it will work. That's coming up next on today's edition of The Professors. Joining us to talk about the five-year education plan for Chicago public schools are Pauline Littman, professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Jesse Sharkey, vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union, Dr. Nick Panamitros, attorney and professor at Kennedy King College, and Kate Schott Bold duke a local school council member at Blaine Elementary in Chicago and co-founder of the Common Sense Coalition of LSCs. Uh, we should mention that a spokesperson for the Chicago Public Schools turned down our invitation to appear on today's program. The five-year education plan, is it a good plan, is it a bad plan, what do you think? We can start there. I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about in detail, but just uh, your first impressions of the plan, what are they? Uh, my first impression is that it, it really, it's old wine in a new bottle. Okay. Um, the plan is very closely linked to a series of essential school supports, which the University of Chicago's Consortium on Education Research mm -hmm. um, put out uh, about 10 years ago. Okay. And in the, besides a couple of tweaks, it's, there's nothing particularly new or innovative about the plan. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just say this, I think, for clarification. There, there are five pillars of the plan. I want to read them very quickly so we have an understanding of what we're talking about. So the first pillar is high standards and rigorous curriculum. The second is a system of supports that meets all students' needs. The third is engaged and empowered families and communities. The fourth is committed and effective teachers, leaders, and staff. And the fifth is sound fiscal, operational, and uh, accountabil accountability systems. Now, you mentioned, I, I think we were talking uh, beforehand, that uh, your concern was not necessarily that these things were being done, but you had budgetary concerns and concerns around the details around, it, around this plan. Why don't you explain Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Well, we don't know how much this plan will cost. Okay. Um, and CPS is in a state of financial crisis right now. Okay. Recently approved this fiscal year's budget and completely drained its resources, its, I'm sorry, its reserves, mm -hmm. and cut what we think is more than $160 million from neighborhood schools in Chicago. Okay. So um, I have a big concern about how this will be be paid for. Okay. Uh, C CPS is facing a, a, what, a $1 billion deficit as well in, in the midst of this. So right. um, your work is in education mm -hmm. policy and you do a lot of uh, work around urban schools. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you tell us, uh, how does this plan compare with other uh, urban areas, uh, plans like this? Is this the right way to go or are we uh, barking up the wrong tree? Well, I mean, I think the plan is essentially more rhetoric mm -hmm. from Chicago Public Schools. Um, if we put it in a little bit of context, CPS just closed 50 schools this spring, the largest number of schools ever closed in any school district. And they've slashed, massively slashed budgets in uh, neighborhood schools, mm -hmm. as Kate was just saying. So here is a plan that's saying um, that there should be more social supports. It's one of the pillars for students. And it outlines a whole set of social supports. We have schools that are completely stripped of counselors, of social workers, children who are under tremendous distress hmm. as a result of the school closings. So how is it possible that they're suddenly going to implement all these things when A, they have a budget crisis, and B, what we see has actually happened as a result of CPS policies under mayoral control, and especially in the past nine years under Renaissance 2010, mm -hmm. is that we've seen neighborhood schools become minimalist schools where they mm -hmm. don't have art, music, or any of these things. So I think it's, you know, it's basically rhetoric and it's it's um, actually rather incredible that okay. they would propose this now. Well, the CPS uh, claims in the plan that they're going to put an additional, I think it's a million dollars or so, into uh, arts education. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done some shows on arts education. I'm a very, very firm uh, proponent of arts education. Um, however, uh, you're, there, there are, it seems like there are two stories going on. It seems like as you're talking, you're saying, wait a second, there are claiming that they don't have a lot of money, that we have to slash budgets, mm -hmm. but now we're talking about we're going to reinvest in the arts after we've yeah. slashed arts. Right. So is, is CPS being uh, fully honest with us? Uh, I guess maybe that's a, a good question. 
uh, can we take this uh, on the surface for what it is? I agree with, uh, with uh, Paulette here that the, um, it seems to be more rhetoric. If there's no money, uh, there's going to be issues with uh, implementation. And it seems as though it's more of a recommendation or a, uh, a directive, but not, uh, there's no explanation as to where, uh, how it's going to be implemented if there's not enough uh, money to, okay. to, uh, mm -hmm. to implement. I will say I, there are several initiatives in here that I support that I would agree with. Okay. I think what we're missing though. Give me one just for the sake of, um, uh, of, of uh, CPS. Uh, uh, the, the I don't want to just bash them totally here. Health and physical education <laughs> okay, cool. program, okay. um, uh, free dental screenings okay. and eye screenings okay. for all students at elementary and high school levels. Um, what's missing here is CPS's vision for what the makeup or what the composition of this district should be. Okay. And what I mean by that is it's it's one of the largest districts in the nation. What is the role of the neighborhood school? What is the role of the charter school? A lot of neighborhood school parents feel that that's a threat. Sure. Um, and and what is the what is the role of uh, the magnet those selective enrollment? That's a very good question. Uh, being being that you represent the teachers union. Mm -hmm. Um are charter schools a threat to the traditional public school system? Right. I, I, mean, I would chime in on what Kate just said. Um, the latest budget uh, it cut traditional public schools by 5.5% mm -hmm. and it increased spending on charter schools by 17.5%. Mm -hmm. um, and th the district, not in a planning document, but um, they've sort of said when they applied for some money from the Gates Compact, they would try to add 60 new charter schools to their portfolio of mm -hmm. schools. Um, yeah, we have um, close to 100 now. We have 96, uh, from what I understand, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, our, in our district with over 600 mm -hmm. schools. We've got 96 charter and schools. And some of them so. have more than one campus. Sure. I, I think that if you count uh, the actual individual school buildings, I think they're close to 130 right mm -hmm. now. Okay. Um, so, yeah, no, this is very much a concern that the district has said that they want to move to a portfolio district. They've brought in some of the, the management consultants, which is the layer of the CPS organization that's mm -hmm. done very well and has grown in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, they brought in people who, who are, are some big proponents of a portfolio, portfolio district plan. Mm -hmm. And the, sort of the idea behind that plan is that 40% of the schools in Chicago would be traditional public schools, and all the rest would be charter oh, or, wow. or managed schools. Mm -hmm. So it goes to what Kate was, the concern she was raising. But no one has ever said that or, or sort of put it out clearly as a goal yeah. and opened it up to public debate. Uh, but, that, that would be a very interesting debate, wouldn't it? Yeah. But, yeah. but there is a general, I mean, uh, it, it seems as though they are trying to work to repair and improve the system. I mean, there's no question whether um, it's going to happen and whether it's uh, how they're going about doing it. I s still think they should be given the credit for trying to um, somehow uh, shake things up and try to move in a different direction mm -hmm. because uh, quite frank, frankly the Chicago public schools have had issues for many years. Yeah, but so let, go ahead, I'm sorry, I'm sure you got... No, <laughs> I was, I was just going to say, well, mm -hmm. um, certainly Chicago public schools need improvement and mm -hmm. I agree with you on that. But I think if we look at their policies, the policies, they've, been, they've actually created chaos in the system. There is chaos in the system and they have created that chaos mm -hmm. in the system. Um, and turn, and, and largely through a revolving door of initiatives, a revolving door of leadership. Mm -hmm. We've had um, how many CEOs? Four CEOs in the past five years? Mm -hmm. um, and through this portfolio model, which um, is actually a national model now, mm -hmm. and which the goal really is to privatize schools. But I don't think, I think what we need to be really clear about is that the opening of more charter schools is tied to the closing of neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. So where are the neighborhood schools in this plan? Or will the neighborhood schools be these minimalist schools mm -hmm. that the charter school push-outs will be sent back to, whereas the resources are really going to go into the charter schools? So yes, they're trying to do something, but what they're trying to do, I don't think, is benefiting the children in Chicago public schools. And there you know, are many ways in which we could support that. Yeah, I think my biggest concern, I think, in all of this, uh, to, to your point earlier, uh, the idea of closing 50 schools at one time is just unbelievable to me. Uh, and the, the notion that, this, that we could retain some level of community stability in the midst of this yeah. is, is just crazy. So I've, yeah. I, you know, I've worked, for instance, I was at a meeting in, in my local neighborhood about what we're going to do now with all these empty buildings in our community. Right. And I've also worked with Safe Passage on how mm -hmm. we're going to get these kids through mm -hmm. various gang territories, et cetera. Mm -hmm. This is uh, a, a, a policy that, for people in the community, feels like 
uh, the folks who are making it are not connected nor concerned with what's happening on the ground. And I think to the point, uh, I too uh, agree with some of the initiatives. I'm, I'm happy about the focus on the parent and family engagement piece. I'm happy about the focus on the art, our arts piece. But I'm very concerned about the turnover uh, and the mm -hmm. school closings. I'm also equally concerned about the focus, which um, Karen Lewis uh, mentioned this in the news recently, this notion of accountability and how I know that this is something that you guys are a little bit, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. When you hear constantly, how do we fix the schools? Accountability, accountability, accountability. This model, I, I do not think is the way to go. And I think for that reason, I have a lot of concern as well. But that this has been, uh, this is the trend towards uh, favoring ch charter schools is, is something that's, mm -hmm. you know, been around for a while now. So uh, to say, to change the paradigm and say, well, we want to emphasize, you know, local schools and work on that. This is something that's already in motion. So unless someone comes around and says, you know, we want to break that. We don't want to have charter schools anymore. We want to go back to our your little school and your little, uh, you know, on your uh, block and your little neighborhood and start putting uh, uh, effort into re revamping that that's, um, that paradigm. Uh, I, I, I think we're talking about two different issues right now, actually. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're missing in that is what is what is the role of our schools? So actually underlying <clears throat> this, the five-year plan, underlying the Common Core Standards mm -hmm. is a focus on education that is about um, shifting education to focus basically solely on preparing children for the workforce. Mm -hmm. It's about economic competitiveness. Mm -hmm. The main funder of the Common Core Standards it's a, it's a Gates Foundation initiative, sure. right? So the question is, what is the role of schools? And when we have neighborhoods that are already under distress as a result of poverty, the mm -hmm. destabilization of housing, the, you know, the destruction of public housing, the dismantling of public housing, foreclosures, um, lack of affordable housing, lack of jobs, school, these neighborhood schools are anchors in those communities. Mm -hmm. And charter schools are not anchors in communities. They are essentially businesses, even when they're run by nonprofits. And they draw from all over the city, and they will get up and move if they decide to get up and move. The, so it's about destabilizing schools, but it's also about really changing the purpose of education. Sure. How do we develop the children in the neighborhood mm -hmm. as part of developing the community? So, so I have to say this. I, mean, I, gotta, I have to, okay, so I, I got to share my ideological colors on this issue because uh, my kids go to a private school, they go to a Christian school. And I've always been a proponent, honestly, of, uh, and I know I'll say a bad word here, of the, of the V word, uh, which is vouchers, because of my local schools, our religious schools in our area having had problems being funded. I was a product of Catholic schools, and I know uh, coming from uh, communities in which they were challenging, I understand my father went to Catholic schools, the option that's there. So let me say that first. However, let me say this to you as well. I have been very concerned uh, recently by what has happened with the charter school movement in the city. Um, meaning that I really, really advocate for options for parents. I believe in options. Yet, I think that we have to call a spade a spade. And when you see schools closing so quickly and on such a large scale, and you see charter schools popping up so quickly, you know, it, it's kind of like if it walks like a duck and, and, it, and it talks like a duck, it, it's got to be a duck. <laughs> for me, I'm saying, okay, I'm for options. Yet, this was never about the notion of the schools being underutilized. This really was about trying to get charter schools in there. And you probably should have just said that in the first place so that you're not uh, uh, assuming that we're stupid. So for, for that purpose, I do have to say that I am very concerned about this movement because of your point community stabilization, and then now, once again, if the schools are not working, the charter schools can easily get up and leave our community. So I think we've got to figure out ways to provide parents with options, but I think we also have to figure out ways to keep communities stable, and, and this is not doing that. So Pauline mentioned CPS's policy. I think we are asking, I think we're looking at the wrong party here. I think we need to, to acknowledge that CPS's Board of Education is appointed mm. by our mayor. Yeah. Yes. And really, That's we right. need to be asking our city and our mayor what his vision is for the education system. Well, I think he's made it clear, though. I really do. I think if you look at the national policies, the race to the top, him, him yeah. being heavily involved in that. Right. I think you look at the movement of accountability, 
Uh, you look at the Common Core curriculum yeah. standards. I think he's made it very clear yeah. that education is going to be sort of top down, yes. sort of one size fits all, sort of mm -hmm. DC driven. Yeah. And we're just, we got to get in line. But how do we get there? And is this plan getting us there? Well, I think it's getting us there, but the, I think yeah. the other question is do we want to get there? Do we want to go there? there? <laughs> where we want to be, exactly. right? right? I mean, if I come in, there's, there's, a, there's a funny way the word choice is used, really, which is that, like, you know, choice is supposed to substitute um, for, uh, somehow substitute for the availability of a high quality school that you can, that you can attend. Um, you look in the suburbs where there's one school that people go to, it's public school, it's well resourced, it, the school performs well, students like it. And that's not where the, where, where the charter movement is right. flourishing. Um, it, it, charters are coming in because they're being, um, they're being sort of pushed as a market so market based solution to a series of difficulties that we face with public schools. Uh, which brings me back to the question of what are we doing to improve public schools? Because I, I think if we're going to have an honest conversation about choice, it has to be, you know, the, the foundation of that has to be an honest conversation about whether or not we're providing a high quality public school which people can go to that's mm -hmm. universal, compulsory, and free. Sure. We, you know, which is in this country has gone all the way back to the 1840s, mm -hmm. is an idea, right? And that's where you get the, the ideas in CPS's plan. Because they take a sound idea, like community engagement, right? I mean, you're supposed to have mm -hmm. community engagement. Mm -hmm. That's what supports a school. That's what mm -hmm. informs the school. That's what gives people buy-in to the school. Mm -hmm. And yet, CPS doesn't do basic things like uh, have its board meetings out in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. after work when people sure, can go. It has sure. them you know, downtown during working hours on, on a weekday. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about accountability. It's not accountability to what the community wants from the school. It's a, it's accountability to test scores, to uh, uh, to growth along that, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, it it's it, it goes back to the question: Does the rhetoric, you know, do, uh, they have a set of goals rhetorically, yeah. but but does the actual is the rhetoric match what they're actually doing? Well, here's another problem in question. So and I love the conversation about: Do we want to get there? Like we we know where the ship is going, but do we all want to head that direction? If you think about it, one of the things that we have not talked about today is that CPS is over 80% African American and Latino. So what we're finding is... 90%, okay. almost 90%. Okay, yeah, like 87, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. The point is, is that um, what we're finding is, and to your point again, um, there are a lot of social issues that we're dealing with coming from these communities, right? I mean, I, I live on the South Side. I understand fully some of the challenges that are facing the community I live in. and. Mm -hmm how that impacts the educational outcome. So, here's the point. Can you work education in a vacuum? Can we set more standards mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, come up with these, these new curricular efforts, et cetera, and then assume that we're going to fix the challenges that our communities are facing? And I would argue that that probably is, is, is completely unrealistic mm -hmm. and is part of the reason why we're not getting the outcomes even though we have been increasing standards for 20 years now, right? But in, many but in many countries, I mean, the community involvement, you brought that up, I think is, is key in, in Paramount uh, in this, this discussion. And I think, again, it's a, it's a big topic and it covers many things. But if you go to other countries, uh, especially a lot of the European countries, I mean, when it comes time to, for people to elect officials, these are things that are in the discourse, that are in the debates. Uh, you know, our, our, with, with our debates, we always hear about, you know, two, three things, abortion and couple other things and it, it, it there's never any talk about schools mm -hmm. and it seems as though it's the culture is is of such that it doesn't allow us to uh, come up with solutions because we never talk about them mm -hmm. or try to talk about how to solve the, the solve them rather yeah. well but but um, I mean to think about it structurally right we have a school board that's appointed by the mayor mm -hmm. who who's on that school board the school board, the president's school board is David Vitale. Mm -hmm. He was the former CEO of the Chicago Board of Trade. This is one of the biggest financial transaction organizations in the world, right? It's bankers and CEOs. But it Penny, doesn't mean that they're, so, they're, they're necessarily they're not elected. A, yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. They are trustees and they're, they're well educated. Yeah, but it doesn't mean if they know and about education either. I, 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 I don't you know. know. I still think that the community involvement with, with good trustees, and it seems as though uh, you can't say that they're bad trustees. I mean, these are. Uh, they're very intellectual, and they and they can make decisions, just like we're making decisions talking right now. Yeah. The point of the matter is the communities are not uh, involved. Well, and that's a good faith question. Sure. Because because here's the thing of it is that you, you're going to you're going to sort of talk about your aspirational vision of the schools as having community supports and, and, and local engagement and 
arts education, physical education, etc. Um, and yet you have some of the most influential and powerful people in our society, you know, whether it's the mayor or his, you know, ex-CEO, uh, head of the Board of Trade, uh, who, who's president of the school board. Those people need to be the ones advocating that the schools have sufficient resources. And they have been very noticeably absent from, mm -hmm. from that conversation. I and mean, I, I know, Kate, like, you must be dealing from a local school level with right. the problem of funds. Yes. And let me make a plug for mm -hmm. local school councils, because I think that we can be part of that solution. We are truly representative of all stakeholders at, at each school. Mm -hmm. So every local school, school council has a principal, two teachers, one non-teaching staff member, six parents, and two community members. And then at the high school level, we have a student. And so I think we are in a unique position to truly understand the needs of our students and to know the community in which we live. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to see more of a partnership between LSEs and CPS mm -hmm. in developing strategies like mm -hmm. these. You have yeah. to reject your budget, right? I mean, you went as far as, as saying that this local school council, and I'm not going to tell the story, you probably tell it better than me. So oh. Blaine is one of four local school councils right now that has a rejected budget that, mm -hmm. that sent a message to CPS that the funds that they allocated to us were grossly inadequate. and that if they can't, they cannot even meet the basic educational needs of our students, how can they afford a plan like mm. this? That's a good, that's a very, uh, very good point. So the question becomes, what do we do? If, if we were making the CPS mm -hmm. five-year plan, what would it look like? So we mm -hmm. sit here at the table with the professor, maybe we can make one right now. Mm -hmm. And then we, 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 you know, we started at least, right? Mm -hmm. What would it look like? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think? Well, I think, um, and I'm not saying this because Jesse is sitting across mm -hmm. the room from me, across this table mm -hmm. for me, but um, the, Ch the School Chicago Students Deserve, which was a plan proposed by the Chicago Teachers Union, mm -hmm. is a really good start. I think the plan for sustainable community-driven school transformation rather mm -hmm. than closing schools, which is part of a national coalition of African-American organizations in cities, mm -hmm. 23 cities around the U.S., is a good plan. I think an elected representative school board would be uh, not the solution, but mm -hmm. a necessary condition to have actually people. I mean, I have attended many Board of Education meetings, and I can tell you that they are not good stewards. Mm -hmm. The policies don't suggest they're good stewards, and they're not listening. And so we really need people who represent the communities and who are listening. And then we need the money to implement these kinds of proposals. And, mm -hmm. you know, a plan like the Chicago Stu School Chicago Students Deserve, which is a rich rigorous education for all children, and um, real support for teachers and professional development, mm -hmm. and real involvement of communities in schools needs resources. And we live in a city which, believe it or not, is not broke. We live in a city that's awash in cash. Mm -hmm. We live in a city Interesting point. with two, the Chicago Board of Trade and the yeah. Mercantile Exchange mm -hmm. together, the transactions are greater than the New York Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. a 25 cent tax not 25 and a dollar, 25 cent tax on each transaction would generate billions of dollars. Wow. Mayor's sitting on a $1.7 billion TIF fund. Mm -hmm. The money is there, but mm -hmm. the political will is not there. That's a very good point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Fiscal reform. Mm -hmm. So at the state yeah. level, Illinois it ranks 48th out of 50 mm -hmm. in the amount of money it provides public education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's astounding. It is. Yeah. And so there are some initiatives that mm -hmm. you'll be hearing about. A yeah. graduated state income tax is yeah. one. I think at the city level, um, TIF, TIF funds. Mm -hmm. yep. So there is $1.7 billion that has been siphoned mm -hmm. from property taxes right. for these economic development mm -hmm. projects in blighted right. areas. Yeah. Right. There are some mm -hmm. states out there that protect their schools, their schools are off limits. Mm -hmm. I think it's a conversation that we should start yeah. having. You well, know, um, interesting enough you said about Illinois' ranking, Illinois is also 40 out of 50 in terms of school inequality as well, which is Which, which we is have not yes. even talked right. about. Right, we haven't. Mm -hmm. So we have very good schools in Illinois, we have mm -hmm. some of the best in the country, we have some of the worst in the country right. as well. And for me, this to me, this question of education is so much bigger than schools. It's about communities, yeah. it's about economic yeah. opportunity, et cetera. Yeah. So for me, when I look at my local community, I say, yeah, CPS, great, I'm happy, we got another five-year plan, excited about that, great. However, what can I do in my community now 
to get the best education possible for these students right. today right. before, unfortunately, we shift over to another administration who has another five-year plan exactly. in a few years. Right. And so that's my concern, and I'm trying to figure out a variety of ways that we empower local parents and communities to, to, to take back education. Because, once mm -hmm. again, when people are in situations when they can do better, i.e. the suburbs, uh, where they have opportunities to, to move, et cetera, they do. I get very angry because we're dealing with, in a lot of situations in, our, in local communities in the city, where people don't really feel like they can do better or have a ton of options. And that's what makes me so angry about the you know the rhetoric over mm -hmm. and over and over again. Go ahead. We've got just oh, a minute left, so sure. let's we got to wrap up here in a second. I mean, when you have to have policies to contain people, um, and and I used this back in the '70s when uh, the uh, Mayor Daley's father uh, implemented the rule that city employees have to live within the city boundaries, and you have to keep people in. Mm -hmm. It tells you a lot. And also the uh, talking about but financial. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but really quick, the lottery money was supposed to go for education. Mm -hmm. And it did, but the monies that were appropriated before, they had they didn't put a closet. That money had to stay in there, and they mm -hmm. pulled it out. So I think people need to be involved, and got to start getting out and vote and get together and start taking some action. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, and and, and this may honestly be, uh, you know, this may be the most important issue that we face in our local communities right now, and it's not separate from other issues. Right. But we can't afford to lose another generation of kids. That's right. Uh, and that, for that right. reason, I, um, I think we're all very passionate. I hope that we will be able to impact and influence this, the direction of CPS. Uh, and, uh, you know, once again, uh, if CPS can figure it out, you know, great. But if not, then I think, once again, I'm looking for ways to empower the local parents and communities to do whatever they have to do to educate their kids. That's right. People should right. definitely right. support the local school councils. Yeah. And, run, and run for the resources. And run. And run for local school councils. Right. Right. Every yeah, LSC yeah, yeah, has two community members. Right. Awesome. Well, That's we're right. out of time today, so thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank That's you. our show for today. The conversation continues online at WYCC.org. We'll see you next time on The Professors.